Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show – Stories about life in the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи! В эфире программа Ушанка Шоу. If you're new to my channel, my name is Sergei, and back in 1971 I was born in the USSR. Funny how he describes communism as revisionism. While not even knowing what revisionism is, while being a citizen of the Soviet Union. And today I would like to welcome you back to Ushanka Show Book Club. As I continue to flip through the pages this amazing book by Robert Robertson, a black engineer from the United States who spent 44 years inside the Soviet Union. Black on Red. By the way, I create a separate playlist called Black on Red Book Review and I'll put the link below this video to that playlist. You're welcome to share or use it for yourself. So, uh, one of the popular topics that my friends think is, those are guys that think that Soviet Union was a paradise for workers, uh, they like to discuss and admire so-called Dama Oddecha or places of rest. So today we're gonna look at the experience of the Soviet citizen Robert Robertson in one of those places of rest and later in the video I'll share my own experience when I went to so-called Domodeha at the Azov Sea and some other places. So stay tuned. So Robert Robertson writes, at the end of August I used the vacation pass I was given for my work on the indicators. So he designed some indicators for his uh, bearing factory which was really saving a lot of money and time for workers so they give him so called he calls it vacation pass uh, some people can translate it as vacation voucher so that's this famous putyovka so this is like a, you go into some place of rest some um, domo and usually we're buying those vacation passes but if you did something outstanding you could get rewarded from your place of work this vacation pass. I just want to make sure you guys understand those uh, Putyovki vacation passes, they weren't uh, for free as many tankies claim. Usually if you are a member of the labor union, which everyone was a member of the labor union, you could buy it at the discount. So the cost was about 30% of the actual cost. Or in this case, as a Robert Robertson, uh, you get awarded with free uh, vacation pass, but still, you know, in America, you're just getting paid a bonus if you did something outstanding. So instead of a money, you're getting vacation pass, but still, it's not really free. Some people probably would prefer cash instead of spending some time out in the country uh, resting and relaxing. By the way, if you are interested in the topic of Soviet tourism and Soviet vacations, I have also a separate uh, playlist, currently has 19 videos and I will place uh, the link to that uh, playlist below this video. So let's see what Robert Robertson uh, tells us about his vacation. So we're talking about 1945, it's right after the end of the Great Patriotic War. A regular vacation was usually 12 work days plus two Sundays. So they worked six days a week because the only day off was considered Sunday. So 12 work days for ordinary people and a total of 28 days for those high up in bureaucracy. So uh, some uh, comrades were what like almost twice more equal than regular workers. My 12 day holiday was scheduled for a rest home 65 kilometers from Moscow. So he didn't go down south to the Black Sea, which is like the favorite destination for anyone in Russia. He just went 65 kilometers from Moscow, so nothing really fancy. So as you see, during the Stalin era, a vacation for the regular worker wasn't that generous, only 12 days plus two days off. So it's a two uh, week vacation. That's pretty much what uh, a lot of corporations here in America offer right now. It's about like two weeks uh, paid vacation. All right, so when Robert Robertson uh, got to his place of rest, Domodeha, the long line at the registration desk immediately reminded me of Moscow. I took my place in the line, which moved slowly, because the policeman checking credentials was being excessively through. So it's interesting, you have a, a cop, which is militioner, standing there upon registration and checking documents. Upon uh, registering, I was required to hand over my passport. And remember, every Soviet citizen, except the peasants, uh, had an inner passport. So if you travel, you better have a passport with you. You can't go to the other countries. There was a separate uh, foreign passport. So this is just a passport like your personal ID inside of the country. And he also had to pay three ruble registration. Then he continues. Then I was given a booklet which had my room number and the number of the table where I'll be eating. So, stalova is so-called diner. 
The booklet also included a list of items I could borrow and use in my spare time. Things like balalaika. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Uh, accordion, okay. Chess pieces or checkers, a tennis racket and a ball, books, a volleyball and a net, and other sporting equipment. And the rest home owners took me and other guests to our rooms. Okay, so now we get to more details that explain you what actually those places of rest were for regular workers. Because people for some reason think it was like real palaces. Um, so here we go. There were no private rooms. Only the vacation places catering to the highest stratum of the Soviet elite had private facilities. In the place I was staying, the best you could get was one roommate, though I was not that lucky. Those room, rooms usually went to the guests that registered the night before they were supposed to arrive. I was placed in a room with three other men, so total four people in one room. And guests that arrived several hours after me found themselves in a dormitory room with five to seven roommates. So it sounds less like a place of rest and sounds more like a youth hostel, right? Uh, the beds were narrow. Two towels hung on a hook above the head of each bed. There was a bathroom on each floor of the wooden two-story building, which was shared by 200 people. So 100 people per bathroom. Hot water was available every other day, in the morning for men, in the afternoon for the women. Every room had at least one window. Ours had two with white curtains. There was no maid service. Everyone had to change his own bed. Clean bed sheets and pillowcases were provided every 12 days. Now, when the Comrade Robertson talks about a two-story wooden building, it's what uh, a lot of people call barak, the barrack. Uh, this is the example of the barrack. Of course, it looks pretty rough, but this is pretty much was um, constructed in thousands or maybe millions uh, during the Stalin era. It was the quickest housing to be provided for workers, so-called barracks. So no running water. Uh, it's quite often outdoor bathrooms. In this case, sounds like they had indoor bathrooms with some hot water, but this is the general look. Of course, it probably didn't look this rough. All right, so back to the book. On the first floor uh, was a large sitting room, which could hold more than 100 people comfortably. In the far corner was a library. Russian people like to read. Open for two hours in the morning and for two hours in the late afternoon. On rainy days or cool nights, people would relax in the sitting room, playing cards, chess, or checkers, or gossiping. An accordionist might play Russian folk songs, and more energetic people would dance. There was also radio in the room, but it didn't work. So as you see, condition sounds kind of like Spartan, right? Pretty basic. I mean, you get what you pay for, and he technically paid nothing for this uh, vacation pass. So let's see what else is interesting. So breakfast was served at 8.30 in the morning at the first floor room with 50 tables and four chairs to a table. A vase of freshly picked wildflowers rested on each table. Cute little detail. The meal was identical each morning. Herring, a slice of black bread with a quarter ounce of butter, porridge, and a glass of tea. Hot tea. So breakfast, I honestly don't know. My dad would eat herring with tea. I couldn't do it. So as you see, I mean, it's right after the end of the war. So definitely couldn't be any fancy meals, but every meal, every day was exactly the same meal. So for 12 days eating exactly the same breakfast, it's pretty tough. So let's see what kind of activities they did. After breakfast on the first morning came a 20 minute hike led by the gymnast and the accordionist. While we walked, the accordionist played popular Soviet tunes and the gymnast led us in song until we reached the spot where we divided into groups of four or five. Some searched for mushrooms. Other picked berries, so they just went into the woods. Some rolled up uh, their pants and waded into the nearby pond. A soccer ball was brought along for those who wanted to do something athletic. Now, there's a really interesting part when it comes to the meals. We were given about 10 minutes to get ready for lunch. We call it in Russian, обед. 
one of the three most important events of the day. Guess two other important events, breakfast and dinner, zavtrak i ужin. Living in hunger during the war, war years had created in most people an obsession with food. This was clearly noticeable when we sat down to eat. Most of the men in the dining hall gulped down their food, unaware or uncaring about their primitive behavior. The three men at my table tested me dearly. They devoured their food, and since I'm always a slow eater, they spent the next 10 to 15 minutes watching me eat. I ate my borscht. I ate my four tablespoons of buckwheat, my three ounces of meat, and my glass of dried fruit. Well, he probably means my glass of compote, which is boiled dried fruit. All three of them sat there, staring. The saliva would drip out of their mouths, one of them. Oblivious, he would suck it back in and swallow it without even ever taking his eyes off my food. I could feel them studying my spoon as it went from my food to my mouth and back to my plate for more. I felt as if these three ravenous bloodhounds <laughs> were waiting to pounce. During my stay, my stay, on the occasions when I left a few scraps on my table, I would hear them arguing over who should get what as I was on my way out. Second helpings were given, but never of meat or dried fruit. Usually, after considerable pleading, the kitchen would dish out more buckwheat or potato. After lunch, we were encouraged to take a two-hour nap. It was not mandatory, but those who did not nap were not allowed to loiter in and around the rest home. And as reminds me, my time back in the kindergarten. Also, after lunch, all the kids were required to lay in bed. We couldn't hang out. If you, even if you're not sleepy, you're supposed to lay in your bed and close your eyes and pretend you're asleep. And sleeping during the day when you're a kid, that's a tough one. I hated that. At 5 p.m. we had a, the choice of playing more athletic game like volleyball. And so lunch, I bid, it's how I remember, always was like around 2 to 3 p.m. This is what I found really different from America when people have lunch like at noon. Uh, in, in Soviet Union, our lunch usually like 2 or 3 p.m. Uh, so then they can play volleyball, uh, listen to propaganda lecture about international communist movement. That sounds very exciting. Or taking a walk. Most of the women went for a stroll and a few men with romance on their mind followed. Afterward, it was time for supper. Alright, so let's see what they had for dinner for Ujin. For supper, we were given four spoonfuls of mashed potatoes and a cutlet, cutleta, which consisted of 85% black breadcrumbs and 15% meat and weighed about uh, 3 ounces. We were also uh, served a small dish of porridge and of course a glass of tea. Russians like to drink their tea. And there's the hilarious part. Uh, so he learned that more creative and determined guests uh, found ways to secure food outside the dining hall. Each morning the same group of men skipped the after breakfast uh, excursion so walking around the woods and headed five miles down the road that's a quite a distance to pavilion uh, to check out what was being sold there so once again remember you go in the store to see what's available at that current day because one day will be something next day it won't be available uh, so he followed them and he noticed that most of the men at the counter were buying vodka and flat dried bony fish less than five inches long called vobla. They've been saturated in salt. So that's a called taranka. It's a dried fish, salted dried fish. So that's what people did for entertainment. Buy some vodka and taranka. And then Robert mentioned that he noticed quite a few guys were smuggling vodka back to the domo de hub place of rest so they can drink it later in the evening. Well, he enjoyed this place of rest so much that he decided that his table mates had become too much to bear. When their usual argument over my food erupted into a fight, I returned to Moscow three days earlier. Okay, so that was experience of Robert Robertson in a Soviet home of rest, Dom Oddecha. But I want to remind you once again, this is summer of 1945. The Soviet Union just finished bloodiest the most terrific war against Germany. Millions of people perished. Cities and villages were destroyed. So it's hard to expect something really fancy. 
but at least kind of gives you a little bit of understanding what those homes of rest for the regular workers were. And now, as I promised, let's jump in the summer of 1985 when I was 14 and that's when my family, my brother wasn't born yet, he was born in 1986 in September, and that's when my family, three of us, went to Azov Sea, so that's a small sea next to the Black Sea, and we spent the first and the last uh, vacation at the Dom Oddecha, home of rest, located kind of like a, you know, Florida style, so that's on the beach, but it's, uh, of course, in Crimea. And usually I spoiled you with a lot of my photos from the Soviet past, but unfortunately, we didn't have a camera back then, and most of the pictures that I have was taken by my uncle, Misha. Well, he wasn't with us on this trip, so I believe I only had like two pictures someone uh, took photo of our family so if i locate them i'm recording just audio right now i will add those photos if not i apologize we're just gonna have a general picture of soviet people uh, having a vacation down south by the black or azov sea uh, so we got this putovkas or as robert robertson calls it vacation pass or travel uh, voucher through my father's work as i mentioned as a labor union member you could get one of those with a nice discount, so you pay only about 30% of the cost. But of course, when the price is low, there's a high demand. So people had to wait when it would be their turn to purchase such putyovka. I already covered that in detail in my videos about Soviet vacation, but the premium destination for any Soviet worker for his vacation would be going to the Crimean Peninsula and enjoy the beaches of the Black Sea. So we got kind of like a B grade, vacation package going to Azov Sea. Azov Sea is not as not as nice as Black Sea. It's shallow, water is kind of murky, and uh, it's not as good as the Black Sea. So the first leg of our trip was a train from Kiev to Militopol, and there at the train station there was a bus that took us to the place of rest, that little, I'm gonna say almost like a YMCA style hotel building uh, right on the beach on the Azov Sea. So the place also had like a standard two-story high, like an American older style motel, right? Our family got a separate room, so just a room. There was no sink, no bathroom, and then of course on the one floor there'll be showers and toilets, so you have to share with the whole floor. Uh, then there was a separate uh, dining hall, Stalovaya, and then I think there was a, like a, a volleyball court and then it had a little like a dance area it was a performers like a, to do concerts and then of course uh, kilometers and kilometers of sandy beach in both directions. And I was so excited to see the sea. I mean, I've been on the Black Sea many years prior when I was, I believe, like six. So that was really cool to see the sea, you know, endless horizon, beach. And so that was awesome part. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and of course, we didn't have a sunblock back in the Soviet days, so pretty much in two days everyone was bright red, like a cooked lobster, especially my father, his skin is so like, I don't say gentle, that he will always burn really bad, so it was quite painful for a couple of days because everyone was just burned to crisp. The main issue is the taking vacation on Azov Sea, there's a, nothing else to do pretty much, besides being at the beach. So we'll have a breakfast in the dining hall, go to the beach and just swim and tan, go back, have lunch, maybe go take a short nap, go back to the beach, swim and tan. Like when you go to Crimea, there's more entertainment, especially at the area called UBK, Yuzhny Berek Krema, southern shore of Crimea. It's a beautiful location. There is so much to explore. You can hike mountains, uh, visit vineyards, visit different interesting palaces from good old uh, Tsar Russia days. At Azov Sea, it's just flat. Besides beach, there's really nothing to do. Uh, so very quickly we grew bored. There was really nothing else to do besides going to the beach every day. Uh, I mean, I like to chase lizards. There were nice, beautiful looking lizards in the area. One time uh, when it was cloudy, me, my dad went to the opposite side. It was so-called Liman, like a really shallow bay and there were pipes laying there that people were catching shrimp so we just kind of walked around in the water it's like knee deep 
uh, trying to catch shrimp, just to catch and um, let it go, just to have some kind of entertainment. And there was a girl uh, that worked in the dining hall. I believe there were students going to college to work in the field of, you know, uh, food distribution. So as a practice, they're supposed to go and work somewhere. So they worked at the dining hall. So pretty sweet job. You just, you know, work as a waitress or cook three times a day. The rest is just hanging out at the beach. So she had an amazing tan and just really pretty. And she was, you know, quite a bit older because I was only 15, but I liked her so much. And that's, I already told you that story. Uh, my father, he kind of got concerned that maybe his son uh, not uh, normal, that maybe he's gay. But I did have interest in girls. I just was too shy and kind of like, I don't say sneaky. I just never was tell telling my parents that, hey, I like this girl, that girl. So I said, my dad grew suspicious, bless his heart. So one time this girl actually served our table. She brought the tray and my father noticed how I was desperately like staring at her, trying to catch her eye. And he got so excited that right there on the spot with that girl standing next to our table, he loudly announces, oh my God, you like her, I see it. You really like her. It was so embarrassing, I turned red. The girl probably smiled, don't remember, but my dad was so happy uh, that he got confirmation that his son wasn't gay. So that was the highlight of my adventures at the Azov Sea. So it was okay, but my family didn't like it because it was kind of boring. So after 1985, we never uh, purchased another Putyovka going down to the sea. We liked much better going up north and spend our vacation in the village because there is way more to do. You can still swim and tan at the river, then you go mushroom hunting, you can do fishing. So that was way more interesting like for my family, so we never did again any trips down to the south. But for many Soviet families, there was almost like a status thing that, yeah, my husband took us to the sea, and then we поехали на море, so that's like my family is doing good, and every year we go for two weeks uh, towards the Black Sea, because that was expensive and not easy to do, so that would be like cool thing for vacation yeah my поехали на море well my friends it's all have for you today i hope you enjoyed this video i hope you learned something new as always don't forget to like this and share with your friends i'll talk to you soon до свидания goodbye By the way, the cool merch for cool comrades is available at the Ushanka store at teespring.com. Just a friendly reminder that my book American Diaries is available on Amazon.com or shoot me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you! And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Ushanka show. For as little as one dollar you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet